So hello everyone, uh, thank you for uh, tuning in to the uh, Oxford AI Society uh, and the invited talk. Uh, so today uh, we have a talk by AI artists Sofia Crespo and uh, Felicon McCormick of the Entangled Others studio. And uh, to shortly introduce the authors, uh, uh, Sofia Crespo is an Argentinian AI artist now based in Berlin. Uh, she studied art direction at the Miami Ed School and also uh, in a course of uh, machine learning for artist, artists uh, at the School of uh, Machines, Making and Make Believe by Jim Kogan. Uh, Felicon McCormick is based uh, in, in Berlin. Uh, he's a, an artist, researcher, and a former architect. Uh, together, they have founded the Entangled Others Studio, who now works uh, on topics blending ecology, technology, and art. Uh, they use generative AI models uh, with photographs and with 3D data. Uh, they are a uh, duo of very successful AI artists and uh, their work is uh, known in the uh, online AI galleries such as the NeurIPS Machine Learning for Creativity and Design Workshops and others. Uh, their work uh, has also been exhibited in uh, museums and galleries in the real world, uh, for example, in the Photo Museum uh, Winter Tour. Uh, so I would say their artworks are quite unique in the way uh, that they approach the, uh, the selection of their data sets and the focus on, on uh, kind of biological patterns and the connections with ecology. So with that, uh, I will hang, hand it over uh, and uh, yeah. Good evening. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good evening. There we go. So, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Felicon and this is Sophia. And together we, um, we share a, as artists duo practice and tangled others. And um, we'd like to start with sharing a little bit of sort of the, our entry point to the way we work. And then afterwards we share a little bit of our actual works. Um, so, yeah, so uh, can you imagine a color that you've never seen before? Um, <laughs> this might seem like a bit of a banal question, um, but at the same time, um, it is actually really quite essential to us because try as you might, and you, you can try very hard, it's act in fact really quite difficult to even get close to imagining something you haven't seen before. And this is, you know, important to us because if we look at the natural world, just for example, the peacock uh, mantis shrimp, which has, you know, they believe somewhere between 12 and 16 photoreceptors, that means that the colors available to the peacock mantis shrimp, you know, potentially are manifold what we can see. So what we can see, you know, within our three photoreceptors, within the red, green, and blues, you know, we are so familiar with, um, beyond that lies a huge spectrum available to, you know, more than human species rather than ourselves. Um, and this is important because when we work with artificial neural networks, they too, you know, especially in the way they their structures are inspired by actual bi biology, they too are very limited by the data that they have been trained upon. I don't know if you want to chime in there, Sophia, at all. Um, please do. Um, yeah, and this is something that um, we find fascinating when we think about how there is a boundary to our imagination, because uh, I can work as a visual artist just with the colors that I've been able to perceive throughout my life. I can't create artwork uh, with a color that I've never seen before, at least uh, I, can I can be using the color and not be able to perceive that light frequency. And so that means that I cannot imagine that. And this is kind of, um, this is kind of a parallel process to the, the, the act of like creating data sets because we're also predetermining what a model is going to be able to learn from. So, yeah, so can you, so um, a while ago when I got, when I started kind of on my journey of trying to use neural networks to envision like patterns of the natural world, one of the very first 
things for me was um, using, extracting the essence, the visual essence of a jellyfish and trying to find that, that space where I can identify there is a jellyfish in an image. So kind of trying to push for that jellyfishness and what that, what that means visually. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, oh. yeah, so these often <laughs> very much take the form, you know, of meditations for us or what we like to term meditations when we have an input, a data set that is then trained with a neural network and which leads to us being uh, able to explore the outputs of these neural networks. Now, this is important because for us as a process because both in the actual creation and curation of a data set, there is, a, you know, already then we have to make conscious and subconscious choices as to what we find relevant or irrelevant. And this is especially interesting when we work with the natural world and the way we frame the natural world, because very often there is quite little data about the natural world, which we'll touch upon in later with our projects. And therefore, you know, often we either have to create data sets or find ways of you know, collecting information. And this is always sort of within that sort of very human realm of what someone has deemed relevant to share, you know, to be in a form usable to become part of a data set, or that we can collect and sort and find relevant. And so within this sort of like meditating, uh, meditation process, we often have a very much a mirroring and a way of exploring not only what we can have of data available, but our choices in that, and in a sense, shaping, um, you know, and exploring the bound, that imaginary space of our imagination that, you know, is part of that process. And yeah, I mean, this is um, a picture of Sophia <laughs> at an early yeah, age. Yeah, so early on in life, I had this experience with a jellyfish at, the, at, at an aquarium where my parents took me in Argentina, which is where I come from. And I saw this uh, jellyfish swimming kind of close to me as it was like this 3D uh, cinema. And I thought for some reason in that moment, it felt really real. So I ran away from the cinema. And later on, my mom explained to me that that really affected, that, that really affected how I related to jellyfish because I couldn't understand where this phobia came from later on. And since that moment, I kind of started treating jellyfish differently. When I was in the water, I thought like they were coming somehow after me <laughs> to get me. And so this became kind of like a phobia that translated to um, a behavior in the real world. And later on, as I grew up and started making art, um, I found myself really fascinated by jellyfish textures you could say in a way because I I personally think that art has something really therapeutic to it that it was a form of um of therapy of exposure therapy in a way mm -hmm. coming close to these images and preparing a data set with hundreds and hundreds of jellyfish um, and connecting to their texture so I found at some point like this parallel process of me curating this data set based on a life experience and simul simultaneously feeding a neural network to extract patterns from it for me so that it would create an artwork. Um, ultimately, I'm the one who curates which one becomes the artwork. And that's the thing that, that is fascinating about art is that it carries so much human emotionality it's not just pushing a button and letting an algorithm do its thing um and yeah this leads to kind of like the way that i see art but if you can move to the next slide yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of where my series neural zoo was born it started uh somewhere in 2018 and it's something that um I'd be lying if I say that I'm still not working on it um, because I always end up <laughs> going back to it. Um, it started with the jellyfish, but it very quickly expanded onto microscopic life forms and sea 
life forms. Um, and later on, those, those weren't enough. I wanted to also generate terrestrial life forms and um, yeah, insects and birds and plants. And I wanted to kind of keep pushing that um, where, wherever I could. And eventually I, I was lucky to meet Felican exactly at a time where I really wanted to move these creatures from the 2D realm to the 3D realm. And I explained to him kind of what I, what I wanted to do and where I wanted this to go. And so Felican, Felican one day had this idea, um, please imagine that we're two people who are not uh, engineers, you know, we don't come from an engineering background. And um, we just didn't know how to do that technically. And we didn't know anyone who could help us do that. <laughs> so one day Felican just woke up and said, I think I have an idea of how we can create a 3D data set and feed a neural network with that by um, kind of creating an MRI scan of the, of the creatures. And that's how we got started. At first, I, I couldn't understand what he meant. It took a while. And then he built a prototype of how to do that. And it worked. And we were both fascinated. We couldn't believe that it had worked. And that's how our serious artificial remnants started. Um, for some reason, we were both really into insect insectile life forms. We think that uh, we picked the insects because it's such an underlooked creature. There, there are so many of them in the world and they very often have um, the, so much baggage associated to them. Like they're related to things that are dirty or, you know, pests. Um, and we wanted to kind of um, make them the, the centerpiece of this work and build a different narrative around them, kind of looking at them from a different perspective. So after generating these 3D creatures, we had these models that were quite bare and we said like, okay, this needs something else. But fortunately we had 3D style transfer tools from uh, Alex Mordinstev's team at Google and with that, we began generating textures. And eventually, we also had uh, GPT-2, which we trained on literature about insects and their anatomy, and um, also their, their names. We trained a special model just to generate their names. And yeah, and that was something that kind of kept adding to um, we didn't know why we were doing this, but it just made sense. <laughs> it just made sense to do this. Yeah. Um, and at some point, I think when the pandemic hit, oh, sorry, I'm going a bit ahead of the slides, maybe. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, these, um, from these sort of early um, specimens, we've been continuously evolving this series over the last couple of years. And as you can see now, for each generation, we've sort of been expanding upon, you know, the forms and the types of insects. And at the same time, as you saw earlier on, we were quite early on exploring using other uh, augmented reality, because one of those interesting things about these insectile creatures, when they exist within this digital space, what we have found is that unlike when you have, you know, a physical insect in the real world, people have a very different immediate response to them quite often. That's, there's, far, there's a far less of that sort of um, instinctual reaction towards them. And we've been now a part of the experimentation we do in the studio is to explore how can we you know, try using augmented reality and other kinds of digital experiences to see if there's any way of creating more positive experiences or associations towards, you know, the insectile. Um, this is absolutely sort of like very much a research process where, you know, not everything works and some things work surprisingly well, others don't, but it's been quite fascinating for us, you know, to explore the potential within the digital space for, you know, having moments of empathy, you know, where the experienced nature, even though it's artificial and digital, can still somehow, you know, you know, color our experiences also of the actual real more than human world. 
Um, yeah. So um, as Sophia was saying, um, when the pandemic struck, if you'd like to continue there, feel free. <laughs> yeah. So when the pandemic struck, um, we found ourselves working on something that was very much focusing on a single creature and what where that creature lives or kind of like the scientific format of how how we look at that creature um so generating a lot of kind of literature about each single specimen and we were very much yeah not not focused enough on the kind of interrelationship that that creature lives with um, and that inspired us to, to kind of shift the focus to, to working with an ecosystem as the main actor of, of our, of this series called, uh, Beneath the New Waves. And we picked the marine ecosystem mainly because of, well, uh, I have, I have a very strong bias towards the sea. I was raised by um, two parents who really, really, they're both really passionate about the sea, particularly my father, who's a sea captain. So I grew up with a very strong connection to those creatures. And I really wanted to do something to kind of bring visibility to them. But very early on, one of the things that, uh, one of the challenges that we ran into was how do we even begin to generate, to, to make a data set of, um, of 3D C life? And how do we begin to, to where, do, where do we get this data to even talk about a coral reef in 3D? So, so that was... That there's not a lot yeah. around. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, for this, uh, we actually had to, uh, there is so little data, you know, especially of corals. And of course, you know, collecting 3D data of coral reefs is, uh, you know, a very difficult endeavor. And, you know, it's quite fraught with peril also for the coral. Um, so we had to t uh, team up with a fellow artist, Joel Simon, who's done quite a lot of work with genetic algorithms. And he has been able to um, produce uh, some rather clever algorithms that mimic the growth patterns of coral. And we were able to then use this to sort of augment our <laughs> very, very um, sparse data sets of coral life forms in order to actually, you know, generate a variety of coral that, you know, was recognizably coral-esque for, you know, populating a, an artificial reef system. And of course, you know, the question is, of course, why are we doing this at all? You know, why are we dreaming of a whole new ecosystem? And this is, you know, on the one hand, you know, artificial life in itself is fascinating. You know, this goes back to the 80s and 90s and a lot of these early experiments with artificial life. But in this case, when we work with, you know, the aquatic especially, there is very little, you know, we know about the aquatic world. There's very little data we have available to us, you know, even two-dimensional data can be quite sparse simply because there is so little of the ocean that we have explored and, you know, fully understood. So by trying to create these new ecosystems, we're also at the same time confronted, you know, with the limits of our knowledge. And in the case of, you know, these data sets of 3D, uh, 3D life forms from under the sea, you know, we are, you know, we run very, very quickly into a wall. And that also becomes, you know, then how can we, use that to you know both represent things as they are now but also to explore how can we then take steps forwards as artists you know to combine in you know what we know what we believe in but also what we don't know and try to sort of leave that open-ended sort of exploration because it acts as helps us you know both at once mirror the the state of you know the the presence of the aquatic in a way that makes it more tangible um and at the same time you know it does it without, you know, <laughs> engaging in a narrative wherein, you know, the beauty and the fascinating forms of the natural world gets, you know, occluded by a sort of a narrative of woe and of loss or of unknown knowingness uh, or lack of data. And yeah, I don't know if you'd like to add something to that, Sophia. Yeah, no, I, I, and I think another 
another challenge was finding all these creatures so that they are represented equally or as equally as possible because in a coral reef you don't have just one creature which is the protagonist they all exist uh, the coral reef exists because there are many creatures that are, that are um, existing in relationship to each other so oh, yeah one of the challenges was kind of how to tell the story of of those organisms that are constantly in in relationship and connected so yeah, so we try to yeah yes yeah, sorry no go on <laughs> no we um yeah, so we've also had this interesting challenge of when we've now also worked more sculpturally with physical exhibitions of these works, for example, here in, at the Maxim Museum in Rome earlier this year. At the same time, you know, when you create sculptures of these, um, it's very hard to, you know, capture that movement and the vibrancy. And this is where it's been quite fascinating for us to, you know, work both with the physical and the digital as two sides of the same uh, coin, so to speak, wherein you know, we can use, use the potential of the digital world to, you know, create experiences where uh, our surroundings um, can become part of the experience and you can experience populating, you know, your, uh, your mundane context with a coral reef. So this has become, for us, been quite a um, fascinating thing, working with different ways of how we can bring these, you know, as sculptural experiences and as sort of, you know, works by themselves, but also, you know, continuously with digital layers wherein the digital and the physical start to become mingle more as a, con as a conscious uh, goal. And finally, just about this project, because, you know, we work a lot with, uh, um, with technology and so on, but at the same time, we've been trying more and more, and it's proven to be very difficult in practice, um, but we have been trying more and more to work now also with biomaterials, and uh, we had the fantastic opportunity with Benicino Waves to collaborate with um, a Spanish um, company, Knife Factory Lab, who uses biomaterials created from the the pits of olives, uh, which is normally a waste product, you know, from the olive industry. And it creates these fantastic, you know, ultimately, I think, almost endlessly recyclable materials that, you know, can be quite fascinating also for the, the aquatic, as you've seen here. Um, we've been continuing that with further projects, but it's been also just as a, a note that for us, it's been quite important when we're working with the physical to try, you know, incrementally step towards, you know, more sustainable uses of materials. Um, yeah, and moving on to another project, uh, the Aquatic Chimeras project was um, a, a slightly different kind of project, uh, more purely two-dimensional, but one where we started to work also more with how can we use, you know, once we've have these models and these data sets of, you know, a wide variety of natural species and groups of species taxonomies. How can, going back to that question of what makes, you know, what is the essence of a jellyfish, the visual essence? And I mean, neural networks are fascinating because especially the visual ones like GANs, they often, you know, they build up an understanding of a data set, you know, from the lower level features of lines, to a sort of mid-level features like eyes or nose or ears, you know, if it's a human you're data set you're training on. And finally, you have high-level features like a whole face. And of course, this is the same, you know, with the natural world. If we're talking about insects, jellyfish, birds, cats, what have you. Um, but when we start to blend these two together, when we take not just one data set, but two and explore how can we start to blend these, then we start to explore also what... What, makes it, what happens when you start to combine and create chimeras of the, of the, um, the aquatic also um, with, you know, the more terrestrial? Because, you know, at the same time, you know, because we know so little about the oceanic world, you know, <laughs> in some ways it's kind of dreaming out what's yet discovered in the depths. I mean, they estimate that we still haven't discovered about 40% of the species out there, which is, you know, I think we now know of over 8 million species. So that's, you know, quite a lot of species out there. And it's one way of exploring this sort of, these interfaces between uh, what we know and what we don't know in a way um, that's, you know, can be quite inspiring. 
moving from that further on from there, we've been most recently working with a series called Hybrid Ecosystems, where we've tried to take that whole process and turn it on its head, basically starting with um, a model trained, you know, upon a very standard data set, ImageNet, which many may know of, which is, you know, for those who don't know of it, is pretty much a vertical slice of reality, so to speak. It has everything, you know, it's the standard benchmark for training a lot of things from object detection to image generation. In this case, um, using an object detection slash um, object description model, which, you know, takes an image and then quite, quite reliably describes the contents of that, but can be turned around and used to um, guide, you know, for example, from noise or other sources to start to push pixels around until it matches the prompt that's been given. In this case, with hybrid ecosystems, we've been trying to use this model, which represents, you know, a very, you know, quite a concrete way, the mundane reality we exist within. And, you know, which is, you know, because ImageNet comes from people, it's 14 million something images gathered from around the world, for everything from people, cats, cars, dogs, TVs, houses, buses, trains, all these very mundane things, you know, this makes up our everyday life. And what if we then use this, you know, this imagination, as we were talking about earlier, you know, and because these models, you know, they can't imagine something that they haven't been trained on. And of course, that's, you know, that means, they, you know, there is a limit to what they can create. But at the same time, this is the same for us humans, yet we are still able to be creative and to explore ways of, you know, expanding our horizons to, you know, augment, in this case, our, our imagination. So this form is an exercise um, wherein we try and... Um, I'll let you watch first. Just to sort of sum up what we've just been looking at, what we've been doing with these previous videos and images is to explore visions of a world where the digital and the physical have been, you know, melded together seamlessly, wherein, you know, what we often see as separate uh, as some harmonious togetherness. And because we don't really have any images of what, you know, a more sustainable world looks like with hybrid ecosystems, we've been trying to, you know, prompt these models to find spaces where they combine you know, the digital and the physical in ways that become uh, somehow more, um, you know, more harmoniously put together. They can, you know, not imagine something new, but they can act as a stepping stone towards, you know, a different way of seeing the world and also to see different potentials within the world. Sophia, I um, yeah. don't know if you'd like so, to talk a little bit. So at some point we connected with artist Robertina Shebjanic uh, from Slovenia, who... Uh, has also worked a lot with the jellyfish. So uh, we were very lucky to introduce to each other because of sharing uh, the passion for, for jellyfish. And, and she immediately um, was on board with collaborating and working on something together. So that was... Uh, that was actually a fascinating opportunity. We got to travel to Slovenia, to Copper, and we started this project um, about 
uh, researching the data from the Adriatic Sea, and in particular, these um, two organisms, one of them, Pina nobilis, the, also known as the pen shell, and the other one, Posidonia oceanica, which is a type of seagrass. And both of these organisms live together in a kind of symbiotic relationship, but currently, both of them are threatened uh, by different factors. So one of them is a mycobacteria is killing uh, Pina nobilis, the, the shell, the giant clam, and uh, Posidonia oceanica is also dying out, but mainly for human cost <laughs> factors. So, so in this kind of residency project, we we got the chance of speaking to to marine biologists from the area, and we also got the chance to well to speak to a few scientists. Uh, and with that, we had the um, this idea of making a piece that talks about how the ocean and these two creatures live all tightly interwoven. So during our research, we found out that the um, Pina nobilis, the, the clam, um, used to be uh, used to make garments with, to make um, a type of sea silk. Well, it's, it's known as a sea silk. And it's even like said to be quoted in the Bible. So it's like a really old material that has been, yeah, harvested since thousands of years. Um, it has this beautiful golden look to it. And we felt like that was kind of an element that uh, for some reason really represented how interwoven all these uh, all these creatures are and how we are also interwoven with the ocean. So we built a machine. Um, Feli, if you can go back, <laughs> I think, I don't know yeah. if it's yeah. uh, there, but if you can see it, um, but we actually built a machine, a mechanical machine. So this is a completely new, uh, thing for us, you know, with our work, we had never worked like this before. Um, uh, yeah, we built this machine that you can actually like, um, how, how do you say like you spin kind of like yeah, a you can crank and rotate. It. You, can, yeah. you can hand crank this machine. And as you do so, you then start to drive these, this bio threads, because naturally, of course, you know, the Pinot Nobles is a very threatened species. So we couldn't actually use any real sea silk, not that we wanted to, but we were able to acquire biomaterial uh, or bio threads, um, which we then, you know, integrated into this mechanical thing where you can sort of slowly with this crank, hand cranking motion, start to weave and to, um, to um, um, pull these, um, these bio threads through the system, mimicking some of the uh, the qualities of the sea silk, which it uses to attach itself to the sea floor, which we know here then is sort of this uh, process of extrusion and of uh, connection uh, becomes, you know, part a mechanical act. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so this is kind of like a, a new place for us artistically. Um, it has, this project has lots of kind of uh, things to unpack to it. Um, we picked a very special kind of thread that's actually made partly with um, uh, seaweed. And uh, yeah, we researched a lot with biomaterials as well to actually be able to have sculptures of Pina nobilis in the exhibition as well, uh, as we are not allowed to um, actually go to the sea and take a, and extract a Pina nobilis, even if it's uh, a dead um, specimen, just a dead specimen. But we got to actually uh, record and make our own data sets with what we saw. Uh, in the Adriatic Sea, and it is pretty
pretty uh, after I, I was I, I acted as the human drone because we actually had a, a marine drone and it was it broke. Uh, so I actually <laughs> I love diving. I love <laughs> swimming and uh, I offered I volunteered for the job. So I actually got to record a large amount of our data sets. But I can say that it is very sad to be swimming there and to see that in person, to see these beautiful clams dead, because they're usually standing up when they're alive. And when they're dead, they're just on the floor. So it's actually, um, uh, yeah, it gave me chills and kind of pushed. Uh, yeah, I think it pushed the three of us artistically to want to communicate something about this this creature even further. So, yeah. So um, that was a little bit about us, the studio, and what we we do. Um, so thank you very much, um, much yeah, for thank watching. You. And looking forward to any questions you might yeah. have. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much as well for the amazing talk. Uh, so I would like to just remind everyone who is uh, currently watching live that uh, just drop some questions in the uh, in the live chat and then I will read them out and then uh, yeah, you can ask basically uh, everything. Uh, okay, so so to give a little bit of time uh, for that, uh, I, I do see some, some questions popping up. I would start with like a very basic question maybe, uh, which is, uh, maybe quite personal to you. Uh, how did you start with your kind of uh, AI art practice? Uh, how did you discover that AI art is the right tool uh, for expressing your ideas uh, and not some other ones? Uh, and uh, do you have some uh, advice for uh, artists beginning in this uh, field? Yeah, um, so Sophia introduced me to machine learning um, and AI art, but before that um, I was using uh, a technique called photogrammetry to 3D scan, um, especially trees. Actually, I was working on a larger archive of thousand year old trees, especially oaks, um, of which there are quite a few and, you know, are very much fascinating things. So I was quite used to the sort of process of trying to create um, digital representations of nature in a way that wasn't, you know, it's somehow harming the natural world, but creating, um, a different kind of presence using game engines, VR, etc. And when it came to then, I was then introduced to um, to machine learning by Sophia. And of course, what was struck me immediately about this was this um, this visual essence. It was possible to extract some essential qualities from the data set. You know, especially you know, for example, with jellyfish or trees, what have you. There was this essence, and what then you were. What then you sat with wasn't just a particular tree, but you know, um, patterns extracted from countless trees or countless jellyfish, and they then became something new, something you know, a purely digital denizen, you know, or an artificial life form within the context of the digital space that wasn't to replace nature in any way, but acted as a very interesting kind of uh, mirroring presence. So for me, that was really fascinating. Um, and that sort of was my entry point because I really wanted to work more with bringing nature into our digital spaces because, you know, we live more and more of our lives digitally, but at the same time, you know, that has not been <laughs> uh, an equal sort of presence for the human and the more than human. And I think it's very important that we consider the digital space not as just, you know, a human realm or something above the world, but something that's very much integrated in the world because the physical world, you know, is very much tied to the digital. They you know, interact constantly, whether we see it or not. And by bringing, you know, natural experiences into that, that was for me, you know, the sort of starting point and one of my main interests. And I think sort of in terms of um, advice, I think it's personally, I find it very important to have, you know, a certain kind of focus or conceptual interest for my own sake. And I started to, and when, you know, I started collaborating with Sophia, that clicked for me. That made a lot of sense to continue something I was conceptually already quite interested in trying to find different ways of interacting with. 
And I think that that's also what's really fascinating about AI arts and generative arts and these things is they are an incredible toolkit which allow you to explore concepts in ways that you can't do with a camera or a pencil or in this case, photogrammetry. And I think that's quite important to sort of explore sort of what, what kind of conceptual uh, or concepts are you sort of interested in expressing and how can these tools, you know, potentially help you achieve that or allow you to experiment with different ways of achieving that, you know, that it's not just uh, a means to getting one single image, but that it's a process in itself. Um, yeah, um, that's, I'm rambling. So I'll let Sophia <laughs> chime in there. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, was the question for both of us or was it just for Feli? Thanks for sure, actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got started thanks to Gene Kogan. Uh, he, well, a friend of mine, I was already interested in, in AI um, from the perspective of uh, like possibilities to, to generate art with and uh, a friend of mine invited me to a small course that he was holding uh, on a weekend for that was like a birthday present for me um, and I was I was excited and I went there and immediately I got really hooked on it so then luckily uh, I was able to go to his longer course uh, the school of machines but for me like uh, every day I wanted to kind of uh, keep experimenting and kind of yeah learn and read about it and and I always say like break it till you make it because that's kind of my my approach it was very much like brute forcing myself into the topic <laughs> and trying to understand um so I approach it maybe with a very naive uh, kind of mindset. I think like I take some, um, I started by, you know, taking code that somebody wrote and trying to run it and see how that works. And then trying to play with the parameters that I can understand um, and very slowly trying to kind of, <laughs> Um, figure out what's happening there <laughs> somehow <laughs> and uh, yeah and then uh, at some point interesting things began to happen in the image I um, and then um, yeah I just remember looking at the results and not being able to believe my eyes like really looking at something and just just I was uh, I was just speechless those kind of first times that I generated the jellyfish and they were all kind of inter interwoven in a way that um, that that it was kind of what I wanted to see but I didn't know that I wanted to see that and that this is one of the things that I really love about generative art because I think it's a form of augmented creativity and artist Vera Molnar who is one of the like uh, very first, like she's a pioneer in generative art and she's like, uh, I think 98 or 95, uh, somewhere between that. And um, there is a wonderful talk uh, by her on YouTube, actually, if anybody's interested, um, where she actually, really talks about how randomness is something that can inspire you to figure out what you're trying to do artistically. And, and I really, really relate to that. So, um, so that's why AI felt like such a powerful tool. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. This is kind of like actually like flowing into the other questions. You may have already answered them. Great. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, so there is a question. Uh, what is your perspective on AI art in the context of history of art? Uh, are there continuities with earlier artistic movements? And uh, to what extent uh, will AI shape the future of art? Because you, one of you were talking about this as like very unique thing, and then uh, the other one kind of like as a continuation of things. So I think it kind of links to this. Yeah, I personally think that um, 
AI art is important because it helps reshape an, a societal narrative about AI, not just about art. Um, of course, it helps uh, reshape another narrative about art simultaneously. Um, and that is the, the narrative that to, to be an artist, you have to paint the painting by hand or <laughs> that you have to build the sculpture by hand. <laughs> and, um, and so, yeah, very often people think that an AI artist's job is to go home and just push a button. You'd be surprised like how many people actually have said that to me. Um, like, oh, it must be great to just go home and push a button and have an hour work. <laughs> That's really not what it looks like, but it's also, um not a glamorous process at all <laughs> it's lots of debugging um <laughs> maybe 90 percent debugging and then 10 percent i don't know <laughs> no but um but i think that on another uh more serious note i think that it is important uh from a societal perspective to give room to um, all different interpretations of AI and different kind of critical critical usage of AI, you know, um, that's something that that helps a lot demystify what AI actually is um, and what what AI is actually capable of. So I think that when I began working with AI, I thought that it was a black box. I thought, wow, you know, this is like, I don't know what's happening, but it's like magic, you know? And then as I began learning that, that faded away, um, you know, that feeling of like, wow, it's magic. It's not really magic, it's math, you know, and, <laughs> and computing and that's, that's it. And it feels like magic when you don't know what's going on. And that was an important lesson for me because I realized, okay, how many technologies do I see from the outside and think they are magic? Or how many things do I see in the world and think they're magic just because I don't understand them? So, um, yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything about this, Sally. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I think don't want to. I think you summed up most of it. I think, <laughs> but I think, as you say, you know, it's AI art has been very important to, you know, sort of be both critical but also explorative of what you know AI can do outside sort of um, the realms of you know purely research or commercial is commercial usages but of course you know it's important to remember that AI art isn't I think anything that can or even should be attempted to uh, be seen as a replacement of traditional arts it is an artistic medium and I think that alongside generative art uh, in general the, which is it's been given, you know, a greater and greater legitimacy as its own kind of art form, which, you know, is able to explore and use, you know, some of the qualities of the digital spaces we have today and, you know, those opportunities and potential that they have. And I, I think it's just very important to remember that there is, you know, an art, art history tradition and art, traditional art forms and mediums, you know, can very much harmoniously coexist with you know these kind of art forms and can also be a, a very interesting way of being critical of one another but also you know positively engaging and exploring you know the potential of these of these points of interface between the two um and you know you go through to the digital and back to the sculptural you know and back to the digital again yeah uh, i won't ramble any more about that but uh, yeah yeah, no, no, great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, we have a, another question uh, in the chat. Um, so, uh, do you have any ideas about insects and other uh, inter, uh, invertebrae uh, being the dominant organisms in the distant future? Or perhaps through uh, work like yours, will they inform and allow our species to evolve? Hmm, that's, that's a good question. Well, <laughs> I think like in pop culture, it's always the cockroach that uh, survives everything else, right? Um, <laughs> and I think like, I think, I think for us, at least for me, it's the sort of working with, you know, invertebrates has been part of the vid has been you know, also about sort of trying to shed some light and explore, you know, 
the incredible diversity of form and function, so to speak, in you know the world of the insects. There is every time you know we've generated something that we think like is like, whoa, this is kind of wild, you know. Um, you go on Twitter and you sort of scroll for the insect end of Twitter. And you just see the most incredible, amazing uh, forms and shapes and, you know, interactions. You know, it's just like every time you think you've done something wild, nature is just like, please hold my beer while I show you this. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's very humbling in a very good way. But I think it's also like there is so much insect life out there, you know, insects outnumber us by millions, you know, per person. And at the same time, they're often very invisible, you know, both culturally and also sort of in our physical world because they have a very different, uh, large difference in scale and frequency. Um, so for us, you know, it's been really interesting to try and explore how can we, you know, bring these into the digital space, start, you know, finding some different ways of exploring and engaging and representing them that hopefully, you know, can also create more empathy towards them. And I, yeah. I, yeah. Well, and there's definitely a bias against invertebrates because yeah. uh, we recently learned uh, by another artist who works with living creatures um, who shared with us that, you know, you don't need to get a license for uh, working with invertebrates, but everything that has vertebrae, you have to, you know, you have to get like a permission to work with them and to, to make artwork with them and it's regulated. So, and it's kind of crazy to think of. For me, at least, it's crazy to think about that because why, um, uh, where does that distinction really begin? That's another life form, you know? Mm. And so, well, this could lead into a very long conversation that <laughs> I'm not going to try to stay away from, but um, it's something that in our work, we just felt really drawn towards these creatures that had have so, um, they're so different from us and yet there's so much to learn about them and there's, they fascinate us so much. So yeah, so we feel kind of like an intuitive attraction to work with these, with these specimens. Yeah. Just to add, where do you draw the, the boundary? Uh, where do you like put plants in that actually like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah what is a lesser form what is the higher form yeah yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> okay uh so uh yeah i will remind everyone still uh there is space for for some questions and uh i, I will maybe ask uh one prepared uh so this is kind of re really i guess this is talking from the perspective of being here and, uh, at oxford and studying like the research part of ai and I wanted to like explore this uh, boundary between research and then art making. Uh, so how much time are you in the role of a researcher kind of like looking at new methods, uh, AI research, trying uh, stuff that you saw in some papers, maybe playing with some public collapse and like working on the technical side versus how much time then you play, uh, are in the role of an artist kind of like using these tools, uh, maybe with actually your own data set. So not, not the stuff that would be presented there in the official research. Uh, and maybe not using the, the the metrics that are kind of used sometimes to measure these methods, uh, but but kind of like yeah, trying to break it. Uh, as you were saying. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it's like uh, from my standpoint, it's kind of like it's a constant oscillation, you know, almost on a sort of daily level. You know, there's always something. I mean, in this field, there's always something new every day. And it's always interesting to explore that. But for us, as we've been working artistically, you know, especially as we've been collaborating for a while now, we've started to see a longer red thread, you know, where, you know, where we use, for example, one a technique or approach for a project. And when we then go to the next another project, what we then is build upon that, explore and using another technique that actually sort of like builds on, you know, how we started, you know, working with chimera-like creatures and then with hybrid ecosystem, which is more of a blending um, of models. And then with hybrid ecosystems, we work very differently with a model, but in a way that also attempts to explore this kind of blending and imagination and, you know, how do we stretch and, you know, expand what we can imagine possible or see, visualize somehow. So these sort of like, it becomes part of this practice, but it's always, you know, we, we, we try to avoid what we call tech demos just 
taking a technique and using it for the sake of using it. Um, but we do sort of like always explore what's new. And then we start to see like how, how is some of this relevant to what we're interested or working on right now? Or maybe later down the road, we say, oh, that would be fitting for this concept here. And then we, you know, go back and see if it's still possible to run it two months later. <laughs> um, yeah. And it has changed a lot from the beginning. At the beginning, mm. we used to stay like every weekend. We were just sitting like trying to hack something. <laughs> um, and that has changed a lot. Uh, like... Now we have more and more collaborations. So we actually are kind of in conversation with engineers and we ask questions and we say like, what can we do? And, you know, that's, I find it, I find both things thrilling. Um, I love sitting and like, if I'm too, I don't know, too hands-on for a while, sometimes it really like, I just really enjoy sitting with a cup of coffee and trying to hack something for the whole day. Like, even if I, I don't know, just trying to understand how something works. And um, yeah, it really, uh, it feels really rewarding. So I cannot say like um, that one, that there is like kind of uh, a rational decision-making of how much time do I dedicate to this? How much time do I dedicate to that? But uh, but it has been great to work with artists like Robertina because she completely kind of changed the way that we work. She's so hands-on. She's like, no, no, you need to go. You need to dive in the Adriatic. You need to like go and record it. And you have to connect to the, to the creatures. Trust me, we have to go there on a boat to the sea. Otherwise you won't connect with the Adriatic, you know? And I love that. And um uh, so yeah, it's been a completely different experience, and it's great to stay step away from the computer sometimes. And, you know, be yeah. be in the sea and uh, yeah, learning about it. So yeah, but uh, simultaneously, we're all the time very yeah, like very much thinking about what can we do, how can we push the boundaries so of what we know and um it's a constant learning like it mm. never really ends because every time we think we understood a tool a little bit to use it there is a new tool out there that makes like more shiny things <laughs> and, <laughs> and then we have to learn how to use it <laughs> yeah but what i like is that what happens, what I've seen, like, uh, from my years in the AI art kind of community, and uh, I've seen that a lot of artists get very used to the tool, and they, they feel like it doesn't matter if there are new tools out there that give them better resolution. It doesn't matter if there are new shiny things out, um, because the capacity for storytelling in the tool that they have that hasn't ended. So, so that's something that, uh, that we're constantly trying to balance out, like how much can we use, keep, continue using this tool for storytelling? And there's so much that, so many stories to tell. Um, and then simultaneously, there are all these shiny new things to, to play with. Uh, so, so yeah, it's it's a juggle. Mm. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, so uh, there, there, there is uh, there are no uh, first question in the live chat. I, I have a couple, like I have, I have more prepared, uh, and one is kind of referring to your older work, uh, Sophia. Uh, do you reject the, no the notion that there is an ideal brain configuration? Which is like a quote from one of your, yeah, I don't know if you remember it. Uh, it's a quote from one of your early artwork. From yes. The, and it, it just like, lead, like I, I loved it, by the way. I saw it printed on a wall uh, at a museum. It was like, yeah. But uh, I, I would like to ask from this, uh, how much kind of do you curate the, the stuff that goes out of your models? Because uh, I don't know, in this particular example, like have you been standing, uh, waiting for the model to generate something this good or... Uh, and, and make more in your current work, actually. How much do you uh, curate what, what your model outputs and how much do you just like let the randomness influence it as well? Uh, yeah, because yeah, so... 
yeah, sorry. In, in research, maybe almost like curation means like you're lying and or something, but in art, actually, curation may be right. different thing. So, yeah, I mean, in art, it's very different. Like, but with Trauma Doll, uh, that was that's a very different project to the ones we've shown because um, it it was kind of like a very different narrative as well, uh, and it's also very personal because those. Um, all the screenshots that you see there, um, those works are sc uh, selective screenshots that I took at the time. So in a way, they really reflect what I was reading about. Um, and that's why I, I, I ended up distancing myself from the project because I feel really exposed by it. There's a lot about it there. Um, I used to say that selective screenshot was like, the new photography you know like the true contemporary <laughs> photography because it's the photography of the internet and where you where you have this kind of um yeah you have your browser uh your your computer open and you can just you know frame something um and uh, choose a perspective to show it so um I saw a lot of photographic potential in it. Um, and so, yeah, those are, those are the things that I was reading about. And I reject the notion that there is an ideal <laughs> rank of duration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, at least in our current work, that we work on together there there is absolutely an element of curation um also because that sort of feeds into this sort of concept of the sort of like using uh, neural networks as a part of a meditative process and that is you know when we explore the output you know just as uh, you know sophia was mentioning vera molna who talks about randomness which allows you to sort of like generate a very large variety you know more than you could ever manage by yourself for pencil in one day and then you can work intuitively with those outputs. So if you train a GAN on jellyfish, you know, and you output a thousand images of jellyfish, you can say that, okay, there's something about this particular group of jellyfish or these shapes, these interest me somehow. They, they create some kind of response in me. And then, you know, perhaps that's, you know, what we choose to work further with or choose to, you know, allow to become part of the final work. Um, and so, of course, you know, it is a very personal project, but it's a way of you know, expanding our, you know, our cap uh, capacities to a way that we're, to a point where we can, you know, go from having these vast amounts of data, you know, which would be impossible to process by hand to a point uh, where we can work intuitively and navigate intuitively within them. And that, you know, has been enormously liberating in that regard because it allows for a very different kind of feedback loop, but, you know, one that's very rapid, one that can very quickly shift and change and, you know, become part of a sort of like both a personal subjective process, but that's also something, you know, we, not to go off and around here, but for us, you know, it's been very important to use neural networks and AI as something subjective. You know, we, we don't believe, you know, there's anything objective, especially when we sort of like with data sets we can create or, co or collect or create, curate, there is no sort of objectivity, you know, let's say you took all the jellyfish images you could find on the internet, for example, and train a model on that, those jellyfish images would still be the images that somebody chose to photograph and then chose to upload to the internet. And already there, you know, there's a bias, a, a, quite a, a, a strong diversion away from all the different forms and realities of the jellyfish. And that's quite important to remember that, you know, these are very subjective things, but it's also, you know, a very, very powerful, you know, creative uh, tool because it allows you to develop voice and have a, a distinct, unique voice in that. Yeah, and, and another thing that's important to note is that um, some of these projects, maybe not all of them, but like a, a lot of, yeah, a lot of times we sat there and we didn't say, let's make an art project. We just started making something. And then, mm -hmm. then we thought like, okay, what if we wanted to show this? Or maybe somebody approached and said, 
do you want to show this? And we're like, how do we show? I mean, we're just playing with this, you know? Yeah. And then suddenly we have to give it a name. It didn't have a name yet, you know? So a lot of times it's kind of this post-rationalization of what, what the work is actually about. And then in that process, we find out what we're actually trying to talk about. And that happened with Neural Zoo because I was just very much in my own little world making these pieces, not thinking about anything. I wasn't thinking I'm going to make an art project now or an artistic series. I was just having fun and, you know, trying to like play with these new creatures. Like I wanted to 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 generate the weirdest creatures and combinations. So I was just doing that nonstop until somebody said, can you give a talk about this? And I was like, where do I even begin? This doesn't even have a name. What do I say about this? And I had to figure out what I wanted to say with that. Um, so yeah, of course, like in the project with Robertina, we very much went and said, we're gonna make an art project, you know? <laughs> And we knew that we were going to make something, so we started there. What do we want to make, you know? Um, so, so yeah, there's not every project has to start with you knowing, you know, that you're going to make an art project. You can just sit and, and play with something and enjoy yourself, and that can eventually become an art project uh, if you want it to, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we have all like uh, nearly passed the hour. <laughs> so uh, yeah. thank you so much for answering all of these questions. I've also read like one comment that is uh, saying uh, that uh, they, they, they thank a lot for, for answering the question about the relationship and repulsion with inter, uh, inter, uh, invertebrate. And uh, it, it's very interesting. So yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, thank also, you. Thank yeah. you from, from my point. And uh, uh, yeah. Uh, also, thank everyone to, who joined in and uh, yeah. watch this thank you space. For having us. We will have more AI art uh, talks in future as well. So, yeah, there is definitely plans for that. Okay. Yep. Ooh, thank okay. you so much for having us. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>